We're still a minute and a half early, so I could sing, or better, I could tell a joke. Oh, yeah? Boy, oh boy. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you a story about Ted instead. This, is, uh, this happened today. We were sharing with the ladies, some of the ladies. Uh, today, Ted and Sue were shooting basketball, and Ted is really good. I mean, he's really good. Um, and he was just wiping her out. So, so he, I said tonight at dinner, did you beat Sue? He said, oh, I beat Sue. That was easy. I beat Sue. I said, I said, would you beat everybody? I'd beat everybody. I said, would you beat Michael Jordan? Oh, no, 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 no. Michael Jordan's in my team. Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley, Dennis Rodman, them, them and me against Sue. So that's a, that's a brother's idea of comp fair competition with his sister. <laughs> He's amazing. Just amazing. Hey, it's great to have you all here tonight. Uh, let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you for this amazing day. And again, Lord, if it gets this beautiful down here and heaven's going to blow us away, how gorgeous, incredibly beautiful heaven must be. And Lord, you've gotten to prepare a place for us. You've been working on that for 2,000 years. And I, and I, I, Lord, I think one of the things you can't wait to see us uh, for is to show us what you've prepared, Lord, and just to see our faces as we, as we uh, walk into that incredibly beautiful place where love is like water, I mean, just liquid all around us, Lord. We look forward to that day where there's, there's no hatred, there's no violence, there's no war, there's no ethnic cleansing. There's just peace and joy and love. We long for that day. Father, I pray though tonight, we're still here. We're waiting for that trumpet sound. But until then, you have things for us to do. And that's going to be uh, making a difference in the lives of those around us through, through you in us. And so I pray, Lord, in some way tonight through this study, you would use us to make us better prepared to be a witness for Jesus in the world where you've placed us. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just realized my wife was supposed to pray. Sue, come on up. No, 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 no. This, this has to be. No, you didn't get away. I'm sorry. I guess we're going to pray again. I brought out the big guns. Father, thanks for this beautiful day, Lord. Thanks for all these precious people in this room. Just you're, You have brought them here. You, you love each one of us. You have yeah. been uh, watching us all our lives. You knew the moment we would be born. You see the day when you call us home. Mm -hmm. We're just so grateful, God, that you know all of that. You see all of that. Yeah. And that we, hard for us to believe, but we are precious to mm -hmm. you. Because your word says so. And so, right. Lord, we just want to stand on your truth and your promises and walk with confidence in who we are in Christ, mm -hmm. uh, being obedient to your word and trusting you that all you say uh, is going to happen. So thank you for this time. We commit this study to you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And help my wife beat Dennis Rodman. <laughs> 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 all right. Hey, we are in uh, Job chapter 1. And uh, for continuity, we'll pick up at verse 13 and then read down to where we ended. Job 1, 13. We looked at this last week, but again, we, if you're first time here, you need some continuity. Job 1, 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were dining at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabaeans raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the fa farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And again, this should be underlined and, and bold print. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up all your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking... A third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in, 
from the desert. And his house, on his house and all sides, the house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground before God, and he said, It's amazing he could come to this thought so quickly. I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be stripped of everything when I die. The Lord gave me everything I had, and the Lord has taken it all away. Praise the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin by blaming God. And we said this last week, but just keep in mind, Job has no idea what happened in the heavenlies. He has no idea of Satan's challenge. All he knows is that he's lost everything. He has no idea why. We're privy to that beginning of the chapter, which tells us that he had no idea why any of this happened. So my, my starting question is, what would your response be? Because I told you last week, I read this out loud at home. It takes 45 seconds to read all those things that those guys said. And we know it's 45 seconds because it says, as soon as he was done speaking, before he was done speaking, the next one arrives. Before he was done speaking, the next one arrives. So we can time out how long it took to, for all of them, those four messengers, to say those four things. And it's 45 seconds. So here's my question. You're, you're the wealthiest person in a large geographical area. You have a wonderful family. You have grandchildren. You're prosperous. Your, your later years in your life, everything's set. You have a great relationship with God. And in, 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 four, four, in four, a total of 45-second messages, you have lost everything. Everything is gone. All that you love, except your wife, all that you own is gone. It's not missing. You're not going to retrieve it. You're not going to find it. This isn't like David when uh, Ziklag, I think it was, where they stole all his stuff and he went out and recaptured. Or Abraham when they stole all his stuff and he, he went and recaptured. It's gone. It's not to be, there's no recapturing this. It's not missing. It's gone. You know, I so, I st when I studied this at home, I tried to process this. If this was happened to me. And I can't even begin to imagine what, how you, what you do with that. Your children, your grandchildren, gone. All in the matter of a 45 second. What would, that, what would your response to that have been? Well, his response is amazing. And I would imagine it got Satan flaming mad. Because this isn't what he expected to happen. In verse 20 it says, Job, his response... It says, he, um, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground. And he said, now this shaved his head, that was a common practice and was usual in mourning to tear your robe. Uh, it, some says rent his mantle. This was the outer garment, which was thick. If you think of a winter coat, that's what this would have been. It would have been uh, sleeveless, would not have had sleeves. It would have been down to the ankles, but thick. And so he tore that in grief. And because of this indescribable pain, sorrow, shock, loss, and devastation. McLaren, the commentator, said this, quote, It is worth our while, it is worth our while to stay a moment with the thought that we are meant to feel grief. God sends sorrow in order that we may know pain. Sorrow has many uses in our lives and on our hearts. Sorrow is natural. That's enough. God set the fountain of tears in our souls. So we are bidden not to despise the chastening of the Lord. And McLaren ends by saying, and it is, sanction it is sanctioned by Christ. Jesus wept. Jesus bade the women of Jerusalem to weep for themselves and for their children. So Jesus gave the example. Jesus uh, sanctioned that in telling the women to, to weep for themselves and for their children. And then after expressing his grief and sorrows, Job's first words are, after he rents it, throws uh, dust in his head, fell to the ground. No, it doesn't say throw dust in his head. They did that sometimes, but it doesn't say that. 
the first words he say are, says in 20 verse, the second part of 20, I came naked from my mother's womb. I will be stripped of everything when I die. The Lord gave me everything I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Wow, isn't that amazing? He said, I came into the world with nothing, and ultimately, regardless of what happens, you can't fight this logic. Regardless of what happens during those decades between my first breath and my last breath, in the end, I will leave this world with nothing. That's his conclusion. And so, Job's bottom line is this. Since God gave me everything, it's his right to ungive it any time he likes. It's all his. It's not mine. And besides, here's the logic, it will be, I will be stripped of all of it anyway when I die. So ultimately, it's not a matter of if, just a matter of when. And that's a mature uh, viewpoint of that. You know, we've said this before, you know, and uh, our, the uh, finance course uh, that's on Sunday night, he's making this point that, you know, th th probably the starting place on managing your finances is to come to the understanding that God owns it all. It's all his. It all belongs to him. Right? Nothing. What do you have that he hasn't first given you? Right? What do you have that he couldn't blow on and take it away? Just like Job. It's all his. And so... The, the point in all that, I think, is God knows how, how um, greedy we are to hold on. And I think that understanding that God owns it all is designed to cause us to start to loosen up our grip on our fingers and to hold it with open hands. There's a lot, of good, there's a lot good about that. You know, we're going to talk on Sunday about the, the year of Jubilee. In Ezekiel, it says that they're going to celebrate the year of Jubilee during the thousand year reign. And the year of Jubilee is that everything goes back to the original families. So they divided the land out per family, per, per family within the tribe, per tribe, family within the tribe. And it's like you play Monopoly for 50 years and then at the end, all the pieces go back to the original families and you start all over again. But the idea is, the same idea is to, is to teach people not to hold on with clenched fists because you're not going to pass it on to your kids. Oh, you might for a decade or two. I mean, if you're 30, you could give them 20 years head start, but how much are you going to have built up in 30 years? You know? So if, you're, if you have your fortune built up by the time you're 40 years, you're just going to be able to give them 10 years of a head start because then it all goes back. And so the point is, what's really cool about this, think of a family that, that has done well in the 50 years. And now it's year 48, and they've got a million dollars. Year 48. They're going, to get, they're going to have to give it back to the original family. What do you think they're going to start doing? Giving it away. That's what I think. Now, the other people have to give it back, but they'll have the benefit of it. There's an equality that starts to happen in all that because they get the joy of giving in those last couple years when they realize, I can't keep it. I can't pass it on. I think that's really cool. We're going to look at that. Yes. The, yeah, it, it, the, back then, land was the, that was the value. I mean, there were no businesses. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. The land went back. The land went back. I should know that and I don't. I'll have to look into that. That's a great question. But, uh, but again, land was... Land determined how much money you made because it was agrarian, agrarian economy. You grew crops, you more land, more money. So, um, and the McLaren says this, the truth picturesquely set forth here is the old and simple one that all possessions are transient. They don't last. He says the naked self gets clothed and then runs around the world with his possessions but they are all outside of it, apart from its individuality. It, is, he, it has been without them. The soul has been without him. It will be without them. Death, in the end, will rob us of all of them. He ends by saying this, The inevitable law of loss is fixed and certain. 
we are losing something every moment, not only possessions, but our, our dearest ties to people are knit together for but a time and sure to be snapped. They'll go, and then after a while, we'll go. And so as Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then again in the second part of 21, Job recognizes that in loss and sorrow there is a reason for praise. He says, I came naked from my mother's womb. The Lord gave me everything I had. The Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, Job recognizes that even in this loss and sorrow, there's a reason to praise God. You know, if, if, you, would, if you would be, if I would be, and I would not be, but if I was mature enough in my faith to say those first two sentences, that would be a stretch. But then to add at the end, praise the name of the Lord. That is amazing. 45 second message. And it doesn't sound like there's a long delay in this. He tore his robe in grief, then he shaved his head, then he fell to the ground and he said, this is, sounds like within a, a minute or two of this discovery, that, Praise the name of the Lord. Not blessed be the name of the Lord. Not hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Why? Again, McLaren says this. Because we may be sure that all loss is for our good. Does that make sense? All loss is for our good. McLaren says, because we may be sure that all loss is from a loving God. In loss of dear ones and things, our gain in losing is to draw nearer to God in being taught more to long for heaven. Isn't that good? To long, to learn to long more for heaven. And then uh, I like this. This doesn't fit in too closely, but it says, Do not blame God for having created the tiger, but thank him for not giving the tiger wings. That's pretty good. The point is, you can always find something to praise God for, right? And it's wise to look for that. Um, I shared the story. I have an uncle, Victor, Victor Ziegler. He's with the Lord now. One of the most positive men I've ever known. And I've told this story in church before. But he was at an airport one time trying to get back home in the middle of a snowstorm and went to the ticket counter of, uh, this is the way I remember the story, of uh, the last airline that could have given him a t flight home. And she said, we're all sold out. Last seat's been sold. I'm sorry. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you're not going to get out of this city tonight. And he said, praise God. He said this to the woman at the counter. Praise God. The Lord must have something for me to do in this city. Now, who does that? You know what I mean? There are people pounding on the table. I got to get home. I got to get out of this place. You know, praise God. He must have something for me to do in this, in this city. And so, look for reasons to praise God. And again, I said that before. I think that makes really makes Satan mad when he tries to assail you and you praise God in it. Oh, I think that really makes him mad. Really makes him mad. Job lost everything. Through all this, Job did not sin nor did he blame God. Verse 22, it says that, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Now, this is very telling. You may skip over this, but think about what it says. Here we discover that it is a sin to blame God. There are a lot of people that blame God, aren't there? Maybe you blame God for something. I've heard a lot of people telling me they've blamed God for what has happened in their life. A man that I met, his brother died, uh, and he blamed God, and he and God didn't talk for 20 years. And, how, and, uh, and it, ended, it ended in talking to him and, and suggesting that he asked God to forgive him for having held that against him all those years. And that was the starting point of that relationship. So the takeaway here is when things go wrong, don't blame God because you can dismiss it, but it is a sin. And sin gives Satan an open door in our lives. So just be careful. When things go wrong in your life, don't blame God. 
And if you've done this, if there's something in your past that you still blame God for, I would strongly suggest you pray about that, confess it as sin to God, ask God to forgive you, and he will, and let God be God, and let him explain to you when you get to heaven why what happened happened. Because he will have an explanation. You know, God is not heaven. God is not in heaven afraid of you getting there because he can't explain why what happened to you happened to you. Listen to that again. God is not in heaven afraid of you showing up because he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he won't be able to explain to you why what happened happened. You will understand for the first time what was going on, what was really going on in the background of all of that. So try not to, to blame God. Then going on to chapter 2, it says, One day the angels came again to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan the accuser came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Now, we don't know the time frame here. It could be an hour, it could be a day, a week, a year, several years. We just don't know. And Satan answered the Lord, I have been going back and forth across the earth, watching everything that's going on. Now, those are the exact same words as in chapter 1, except the angels came again. Except for that, the exact same words. And you know, it made me wonder, it sounds like this is kind of a standard question and answer period between God and Satan. This is maybe a standard exchange that takes place before, before God. Satan, where were you today? I've been looking, patrolling, the, the, the Hebrew really means, I've been, been patrolling the earth and uh, um, watching everything that's going on. So what does that mean today if he's patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on? He has a lot of opportunities with all that he sees. Verse 3, it says, And uh, then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth, a man of complete integrity. And by the way, these are the exact words from the first chapter. A man of complete integrity. He fears God and will have nothing to do with evil. Now it changes. This is addition. And he has maintained his integrity, even though you persuaded me to harm him without cause. Same words, except even though you persuaded me to harm him without cause. And Satan is all ready for this, isn't he? He's all ready. He lost his bet with God because he said, if you let me take every, all of his possessions away, he'll curse you to your face. Yes. Say it again. Who witnessed this? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the commentators deal with that. God made it known to the writer of this book. Yeah, yeah, because no human being saw this. Yeah, it had to be divinely in, in, in shown to somebody. Uh, but that's a great question. So, uh, he lost his bed with God. And so Satan isn't the smartest man in the room like he thought he was. He thought he was going to get God on this one, and Job came through. But Satan is not done with Job yet. In verse 4, he comes back with his reply. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin. He blesses you only because you bless him. A man will give up everything he has to save his life. Now, this isn't in my notes, but just think about that. This was Satan's thinking then. This is Satan's thinking now. A man will give everything up he has to save his life. You know, I'm thinking of this as I'm talking, but, you know, I, 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 I love what I do. I love being a pastor. It's such an honor to sit with people when they're going through life-threatening illnesses and talk with them and pray with them about that, to anoint them. It's such an honor. But to think about the fact that when these illnesses hit them, that Satan's strategy is that um, take away his, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. That when someone comes down with cancer, Satan looks at that man and says, He'll give up everything he has to save his life. He'll do anything he has to to save his life. 
And so, you know, if that ever happens to you, what a challenge that is for us to live a, 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 a godly life through that trial. Because you know what he's thinking. You know what he's thinking. You know, in Revelation, it says they overcame uh, the enemy by their, their testimony and by the word, of the, and the word of God, and that they did not love their life. They did not love their, their life. Uh, they did not love their life unto death or something like that. But they're not afraid of dying. If you're not afraid of dying, there's really nothing Satan can do to you. If you're saved and you love the Lord, you love the word, and you're not afraid of dying, that's really, uh, that's what Revelation says. Um, that's, that's what gives you protection. You're not afraid of, not afraid to die. And then verse four, again, skin for skin. Commentators talk about that. What, no one's really sure what that means, skin for skin. Does he mean the skin that he's going to take away, the, the blisters, the boils he's going to get on his skin? But to me, it always made sense. Skin for skin. He blesses you only because you bless him. A man will give up everything he has to save his life. Take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. And Satan knows us so well. We'll talk about that in a moment. You know, when this is, scene is taking place here, I picture Ebenezer Scrooge being put to the test on this one. Imagine Ebenezer Scrooge converting all of his assets to gold coins. And he's holding them in a box in his arms. And Satan comes up to the table. And Satan says, Ebenezer, would you give up all that you, would you give up all that you own, all of your gold for your job? No. Would you give up all that, would you give up your brother, would you give up your gold for your brothers and sisters? No. Would you give up all your gold for your children? No. Would you give up all your gold for your wife? No. Would you give up all of your gold for your life if you're going to die in one minute? Probably yes, right? So Satan's attack here is pretty accurate. You know, you, you take a greedy man, and he probably wouldn't give up, any, give up his assets for anything but this, to save your life. There's a lot to this. And it's true. It's true for us too. A loss of health, a threatening life condition causes, and I've seen this being a pastor, It'll cause you to ask questions you've never asked before. It will. It'll, it'll cause you to go places you've never been before, dark places. It'll cause you to question things you've never questioned before. And Satan knows this. But once again, Satan cannot touch your health unless God allows it. Remember that. Satan cannot, if you're a believer... Satan cannot touch your health unless God allows it. But can you get sick otherwise? Can you get sick without Satan creating it, organizing it, masterminding it? Of course. As an example, let's say there are 50 people in a room, and you knowingly put yourself in that room for 48 hours, and all of those people have the flu except you or something else that might be going around at the present time. So, 50 people have the flu. You're in the room for 48 hours with them. Will you get the flu? Probably. Why? Did God, did Satan send it? Well, he might have sent the idea to go into the room, but he didn't send it. No. You, you made a choice to go into a place you shouldn't have gone into. He didn't need to. Did God give you the flu? No. You exposed yourself to the flu. And here's the truth. Because we are human and because Adam sinned, you and I are exposed to death and illness and decay that entered the world the day Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. That's a part of the curse. In fact, that's called the curse. And cancer is a part of the curse. You can get cancer passively without either Satan or God giving it to you. But... The trump card is on this passivity 
on, on this passivity getting cancer is Romans 8.28 trumps the cancer. Right? Romans 8.28 trumps the cancer. If God can't use the cancer for your good, he won't send it. If God, what does Romans 8, 28 say? All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and, and are the call to according to his purpose. All things. Some people say that's a little too all-inclusive. It's totally inclusive. Everything. All things. Do you ever look up the word all in Hebrew or Greek? You know what it means? All. All things work together for good. So you get cancer. God can use this for my good. And, and again, I've often said this to people, and here's, here's the proof of that. If the word of God is true, and it is, and that means if you get cancer and you die at the age of 45 or 35, or whatever that age is five or 10 years from where you are right now, or 95 in my case, and you die, and you go to heaven, and you say, God, you said all things work together for good to those that are called according, called according to the Lord. I got cancer. How did that work out for my good? And he's going to show you how that worked out for your good. And you know, I've said this before. I think that's one of the reasons we're going to fall down on our face and worship the Lord in heaven. Because I believe, I'm not saying I'm right in this. It's just what I believe. I believe in heaven, all those things that we don't understand, why they happen, they're going to be made clear to us up there. And we're going to be so sorrowful for doubting God, questioning God, not believing that promise when we see what he did. Or so let's say you die at the age of 55 and you, you have children and grandchildren and you get to heaven and you say, God, why? I never really got to enjoy my grandchildren. Why? And God says, well, let me just show you how things would have played out. And he runs this out, and he runs that, and he runs out, and he says, as a result of you dying at 55 and your children, your grandchildren being at your funeral service, your one daughter, your one son accepted Christ at the funeral service. We were going to lose them. They were, be, they were going to become so prosperous and so wealthy that they were, they were headed down that, that, that track, and they were never coming back. This was the moment. Now, here's the question. If Jesus says this to you. Here's the question. Are you glad you came at 55? Or would you rather have made it to 80 and know that your son and daughter are in hell? Huh? What are you going to say? See, he'll have that for everything we don't understand. There's a reason all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and have to call it according to his purpose. He will have a reason. And if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, then God's going to owe people apologies in heaven. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was so afraid of the day you were coming. I, I, you know, the angel said it was in a month, and then it was a week, then it was three days. I thought, oh, what am I going to say when he gets here? Because, man, back in 2014, that thing happened to you. And I tell you what happened. I was, I was, I was in, I was in, um, in uh, uh, Spain. There was this uprising in Barcelona. It was horrible. And, and I had to be there to, to put this thing down. And I saw you in trouble. And, but, I was in, I, but I had to do this thing in Barcelona. I saw you in trouble, so I settled it real quick. I was flying over the Atlantic Ocean, whoosh, top speed. I got to New Jersey, and bang, I missed it. I missed you by 38 seconds. I'm sorry. I just couldn't get there in time. You think it's going to happen? You think God's going to owe anybody an apology? No. We're going to owe the apology. In that we doubted, in that we questioned. And because uh, all things work together for, for good. So, um, and as I said, cancer is a part of that curse. And I believe that this would be any illness that could eventually take you out. I did add something here on anointing. If I could have somebody hand these handouts out. How about some able-bodied young men. If you could, um, I've got 50 of these. If you could give one to everybody. Or if you're a couple, maybe, I'm not sure if there are more than 50 here, but. Great. And then everybody? Yeah, everybody, unless you're a couple. 
Do we have 50 people here? Okay, we'll see how many we have. So, some of you have not heard this before, and um, I thought, you know, this is a good place to do this because this could save your life someday. It could save the life of your child. It could save, it could heal you of cancer someday. While we're on life-threatening illnesses, this is a good place to cover this, and this is from James chapter 5. Some of you know right away where I'm going with this. And this is anointing with oil for healing. So, listen to what James chapter 5 says. It says, James chapter 5 verse 14, Are any among you sick? He sh they should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And their prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make them well, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. So just listen close to that. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and they will anoint them with oil and pray for them in the name of Jesus. This is the only scriptural remedy God gives in the New Testament for healing. This is it. There's no other, there's no other prescription for healing. It's James chapter 5. Now, before we dig into this, I, I want to ask you a question. Do you think there's anyone that's ever been anointed with oil that was healed that would not have been healed otherwise? Do you think that's true? Or do you think everybody would have been healed anyway? Well, if you think everybody would have been healed anyway, then why is it in there? Right? It, it, it serves no purpose if everybody would have been healed anyway. So... We know, logically, there are some people that get healed, physically healed, from James chapter 5. What it also says is that they should call for the elders of the church. What's really cool about that is the gift, this is not a gift of healing given to a person. Uh, someone doesn't run around and say, I have the gift of healing. I can heal you. No, it comes with an office in the church. Just by being an elder, that office has the ability to anoint with oil. And what I've said, and some of you have heard this before, and I apologize, but what it does is it brings closure to what your responsibilities are before God. Remember I said when you get sick, you ask questions you never asked before? It'll take you places you've never been before? Here's one of the questions you ask. Probably. You will say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Because what's my responsibility before God with this illness? Well, we go to the doctors. We should. That's why babies die of burst appendixes because they pray to God and don't go to doctors. You should go to a doctor. You should pray. But you should also consider James chapter 5 because what I started with was that understanding there are some people that would not have been healed. There are some people that were cured of cancer that would not have been had they not been anointed. We have anointed a lot of people through the years. Some left. Wow, that's a loaves and fishes story right there. Um, we've anointed a lot of people through the years. And we just had, within the last two weeks, a woman came up and said, we anointed her, and she, they, they had cancer. They had, a, they, they had a CAT scan, X-ray, something. And it showed a mass. We anointed her. She went back. They took, it, took the image again. He said, this is a miracle. It's gone. There's nothing on your screen. We, we've seen that multiple times. That same story. You know? Um, so I just encourage you. And the article that I handed out there is... Uh, take the one that says anointing with oil may be for you. Okay? And down at the bottom, in the, in the body there, in the middle, it says actually the word James uses for sick is a Greek word which means to lose strength. There are many experiences in life that cause us to lose strength, not just physical illness. There are a wide variety of sicknesses we may experience in life, emotional, psychological, spiritual, as well as physical. The brethren, this was written by Galen Hackman, who's a brethren pastor. The brethren pastor's minister, Emmanuel, lists a variety of times when seeking anointing might with oil might be appropriate. When experiencing decline in health, suffering of disease, an injury, illness, 
when dealing with depression or disillusionment, before a scheduled surgery, before making a weighty decision, after receiving a word of a terminal illness, after a marriage separation or divorce, after a miscarriage or death of a loved one, when losing a job, when there's brokenness in a relationship, when answering the call to a new ministry or making significant commitments of service to lay hold of God's promise for forgiveness, when increase of faith is needed. Again, it says when someone is, it means when they're sick, to lose strength. So I encourage you to keep this in mind. You have a friend. Listen, when Jesus healed people, did they first have to profess that I put my faith and trust in you, Jesus, and I'm going to tithe to the 12 disciples after you're gone? Did they have to do that? No, he healed indiscriminately, right? And what did his healing accomplish? It caused them a faith in him, right? So my point is, if I were you, if you work with someone and they're not a believer, and they have a son that gets very ill, or their wife gets very ill, or their husband gets very ill, I would say there's a verse in the Bible that talks about being anointed with oil and that God would, would use that to heal. If you want, I could, if you come to church on Sunday, I could have one of our pastors anoint your son with oil for healing. You know what that could accomplish in the life of that person? To have that done? Listen, you know this, many of you know this, but some of you might not. If you're in a work setting and there's someone you've worked with for a whole bunch of years and they are openly hostile to the gospel, you can't talk to them about Jesus. I'll give an example. Uh, this is being recorded. I'll take the chance. At the dealership, there was a technician that we employed, and he wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing. I couldn't talk to him about anything, because, in fact, we had, a, we had a sign in our service department. It was John 3.16. It's a long story. I, 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 I sent out to a sign painter. I wanted John 3.16 put on a big sign. Just John 3, colon, 1, 6. I didn't make it clear. He put the whole John 3.16 on a big piece of board. You know, for God's all the world, they give them. So I hung it up in the service department. The technicians told me that every time the first snow, when there was a first snow and a car would come in, the, in the shop with snow on it, he'd make a snowball and throw it at that sign. That's what he thought about my Jesus. Now, his wife got sick one time. And I talked to him about it. And I said, could I pray for her? He said, yes. So my point is, if you have someone in a work setting and they're close to the gospel and something comes up where there's an illness that's touching them, them or a family member, especially a child, that's an open opportunity to pray with them. Ask them if you can pray. I've never had anybody say no. No one's that hard. No one's that hard. But the anointing is the same thing. You say, well, they're not even a believer. That was my earlier point. They don't have to be. It's an opportunity for God to get the glory through what happens. Suggest it. Suggest it. It may be the beginning of a relationship with the Lord. Now, on the anointing, what it does is it brings closure to what your responsibility is before God. It allows you to say, I've done everything God has wanted me to do, and now this is surrendered to the Lord. So I tell people this. Can it ever be wrong to pray for somebody's salvation? No. Can't be wrong. That's God's will. You know it's God's will for them to be saved. Doesn't mean they will be, but you know it's His will. Is it always God's will for every person to be healed of an illness? Good answer. Good answer. Some say yes, and that gets them in a lot of trouble down the road. You've got to be very careful of that one. But no, you don't know if it's his will. So here's the dilemma. In James chapter 5, we're supposed to pray for healing. But we don't know if it's God's will for that person to be healed, right? He may have a, a different plan than the healing. You with me? You tracking? You with me? So here's, here's the reality. So when we pray, I say, I, I say we're going to pray in faith believing that God's going to heal you of this cancer. And we all know he can. He created all that is seen and unseen in six days. 
He can heal you of this cancer. There is no question he can heal you. So we're going to pray in faith, believing that he will, or allowing him to do something even better if he chooses to do something better instead. See, this is where people go south. This is where when they pray, they actually, in their mind, say something like this. God, I pray that you would heal, oh, Joe, but if you're not willing to do that, I can live with that. That's okay, too. But that's not the right prayer. Because that's saying that, God, if you're not willing to give me what I'm asking for, I'll settle for less. That's not, that's not what God does. You see, when you trust God in a situation, you say to God, God, this is what I'm praying for. But if you choose to do something better, why would I not want better? Different from what you ask in this situation is not less than, it's better than. Do you get it? It's not less than, it's better than. God's love is not capable of disappointing when you trust in his love. Not possible. Not possible. And I'm back to the old premise. If I'm wrong, you're going to get to heaven and he owes you an apology. He won't. Not because he's too big to give an apology, because he knows what he's doing. And listen, you may say that sounds like a cop-out. I'm going to tell you something. I've prayed this prayer just like that with people in, in, in hospital rooms with inoperable brain tumors, with, with things that were really bad. And when I say to them, and then I quote Matthew, where it says, what, fa- what son asks his father for a loaf of bread, and he gives him a stone instead? Or if he asks for a fish, we give him a scorpion. He said, of course not. And he said, if you hard-hearted fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, don't you think your heavenly father will do the same, at least the same for you? Do you get it? So when we anoint, we're asking for a loaf of bread. He is not going to give a stone. He might give you angel food cake. That's better than, that's better than a loaf of bread. At least it is to me. But he isn't going to give you a stone. So I tell people, it's like this. You're, there, people are not, this is how it ought to be. You're not, and, this, and see, this is what makes Jesus' prayer in the garden make sense. If it be your will, take this cup away from me. If it be your will, take this cup away from me. If it be your will, take this cup away from me. But, but not my will, but thine be done. And when we hear that, we hear Jesus surrendering to God doing less than he's asking. It's not. <laughs> it's a surrender to God to do more than he's asking. More than he's asking. So you're in a hospital room with five believers and you're praying for Joe who has cancer. He's in bad shape. You're all around the table. You're praying. All around the bed. You're holding hands praying. And you say, God, please heal old Joe here. He's a great guy. We love him. We we know you can. Next person prays. Father God, we just have all the faith in the world that you can heal Joe. And as you go around that group of people, this, this prayer starts to take on the wings of faith. I mean, it just gets... Woo, it's like, wow, this is, the Holy Spirit is here empowering us to pray. But then at the end, someone says this, but thy will be done. And that whole prayer of faith comes crashing the ground because of a misunderstanding what that means to submit your, yourself to the will of God. You see, if you have a plan and you submit yourself to the will of God and, he, and you trust him in that and he does something different than you're asking, it can only be because the different is better than you're asking, not less than. It's not possible. His love cannot disappoint you when you trust him. Doesn't matter the situation. Doesn't matter what's going on. Not possible. And as I said, it brings closure. When Sue and I were in our 30s, we wanted to have children. And uh, there was no medical reason why we couldn't have children. We could have done the in vitro thing. We just didn't feel, we felt God closed and opened the wound. Everybody figures that out for themselves. That's where we came out. But we went to the elders of our church and we were anointed for healing, for having children. And when we walked away from that, we both felt that God gave us closure that day in really trusting him through that. And God has blessed us in so many ways. Would children have been a blessing? Of course. But I know we've been blessed more than had we had children because if that wasn't true, we would have had children. Did you get it? There's the proof. <laughs> yeah. So a lot... A lot to say about this. Oh, and one other thing, if you, ever, if you ever have a friend at work or someplace and you suggest maybe them being anointed for oil, know that in the Catholic Church this is called last rites. 
they take this to mean last rites, and, and they only call the priest in when you're, you're five minutes away from dying. And so if you suggest anointing with oil, some people are going to say, you think I'm dying? You think I'm dead? I'm not going to call for the priest to, to certify that I'm dead. You know, so just understand that you might have a little ex explanation to do there. So I'd encourage you to keep that article. It's good. Read it. And um, if you get in a situation where there's a health issue, we, we, do, we do anointings almost, I'd say at least every other Sunday we're anointing someone with oil for healing. And so if that ever comes up, please see one of us. We would be honored to do that and be a part of that. So that's James chapter 5. Let's, um, let's go on. Any questions on that? Okay. You. Yes. The oldest book in the Bible. Yep. No. Nope. It's not chronological. Yep. Most believe that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Well, uh, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So that would have been, uh, tradition would have been handed down uh, from Genesis orally until Moses came and then was divinely inspired to write what he wrote. Yeah, we don't know who wrote the book of Job, but many do believe it's the oldest book. So let's go on. Um, Job chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. It says, Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, he blesses you only because you bless him. A man will give up everything he has to save his life, but take away his health and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence and he struck Job with a terrible case of boils from head to foot. Did you get the picture? This poor guy has just been through everything. Again, we don't know the time frame here. It could be a day, could be a week, could be a month, but now he's going to get nailed with uh, an illness. And what does that tell you about Satan? It tells you that he has the ability to send illnesses when God allows it. Now that's profound. Listen to that again. You can't deny it. It's right here in black and white. Satan has the ability to send illnesses when God allows it. Now, the implications are huge. We said this before. When you get ill, there are certain bases you cover. Number one, you pray to God. First place you go. Secondly, you go to the doctors, as you should. Third, you anoint with oil. But fourth, I believe it's important to acknowledge that Satan could be causing it. It's possible. He sends it. And Jesus knew this. And Jesus dealt with this. Look in Luke 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke 13. Verse 10. Luke 13, verse 10, it says, One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. Does that need any interpretation? Was crippled by an evil spirit. She had been double bent for 18 years. Now, double bent, they think that means that her curvature of her spine was so that she walked like this, that she had to walk like that. And was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised and thanked God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant, angry, that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. 
Come in those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, you hypocrite. He made a friend there, didn't he? You hypocrite, you work on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from their stalls on the Sabbath and lead them out for water? And wasn't it necessary for me, even on the Sabbath day, to free this dear woman, listen, from the bondage in which Satan had held her for 18 years? So we learn from Jesus that Satan had held this, and he knew, Jesus knew what was going on with this woman, that Satan had held her in this bondage for these 18 years. When I taught on this, I said, there's a lot of profound truth in this. You know, if you've ever heard of some faith healer that's not a Christian, some faith healer that, or some other religion, and they heal people of illnesses, real illnesses, and you say, whoa, how can that be? Listen, if Satan causes an illness, can he lift the illness off of them? So he's the deceiver. That's his role. Can you imagine how much mileage he can get out of it by having some of his false prophets, his false uh, religious leaders heal people to give them credibility that they're really of God? But it was just him causing the illness and then him taking the illness off of them. You say, well, why in the world Satan is so male ma ma malevolent? Why would he ever take an illness off of someone once he has it on them to accomplish a greater good for him? Yeah, yeah. So the point is, the, the bigger point I wanted to make here is Satan can cause some illnesses. And I believe that God has given us the authority in some of those situations to deal with those. Uh, he, Jesus did, and he freed this woman from them. Now, so we know Satan can sell, send illnesses. Uh, can I deal with it if he does? Well, if, if God is allowing that illness from Satan, as he did with Job, then it's improper to ask for it to be taken away from you, even if Satan sent it. Because Satan, if Job would have prayed and said, uh, Satan, take this illness off of me, what would Satan have said? Who said that? That was the right answer. Was that my wonderful wife? Yeah. Yeah, God allowed it. Satan would say, no, I'm not taking this off. God gave me permission to send this illness. So we could not. So when we deal with this, we acknowledge that some illnesses could be from Satan, God allowing it to work for our good in our life, to bring about a refining work in our life. That's possible. But apart from that, if he sends an illness, I believe we have the ability to use the name of Jesus against that and to deal with that. So, as I say, you know, there, there are four places to go. You go to God, you go to your doctors, you anoint, and then just deal with it just briefly. I mean, Satan, I don't, this is what I say. Satan, I don't know if you're causing this illness. I don't know. How could I know that? I don't know. But I do know this. I know that if you're sending this illness, apart from God's expressed will, I know that I have the authority to command you to take this illness off of me. And so I do. I command it in Jesus' name. Maybe something's there. Maybe it's not. I don't have to figure that out. I just cover my tracks. I just cover the bases. I give you a lot of examples, a lot of stories. Um, I'll just give you one. When I started doing this, I had, a pain, I had a pain in my ear for many, many years. It was like someone was taking an ice pick and driving it into my ear. That hurts. I mean, you, you kind of, if you ever had that, it's like, oh man, I have to lay down and keep my neck a certain direction. And it was just, uh, you know, you just couldn't get rid of it. And I thought, I'm going to try this sometime. Because I started doing spiritual warfare and I thought, I wonder if it could be connected to this. And so when it came, I would say, Satan, I don't know if you're causing this pain. I don't know, how, how could I know that? I just know that if you are, and if you're causing this apart from God's express will, I know that I've been given the authority to use the name of Jesus against all the power of the enemy. So in Jesus' name, I command you to take this pain from me. And invariably, within 15 seconds, 20 seconds, it was gone. This was a pain that would last for hours. And it really started to get kind of interesting because I thought, I thought, Satan, why do you keep sending this? Because all you're doing is causing me to know all the more the power there is in the name of Jesus every time you send it and it goes away. 
Do you know what I mean? So this is not theory to me. I could give you a lot of examples. This is not theory. Is it all the time? No. Half the time? No, probably not. I have no idea. Just, I just encourage you to cover your bases. Listen, listen, how would you like, we'll end on this. How would you like to get to heaven and you say, God, there's one thing I don't understand. In 2018, I got an illness that knocked me out for a year. I was laid flat. What was that all about? I don't want to hear Jesus say, that was an attack from the enemy. Because here's what would happen next. Because I know how that discussion would play out. Why did that happen to me in 2018? That was an attack from the enemy. And then what would I say? Well, what was I supposed to do about that? I know what I was supposed to do about that. Right? I'm supposed to use the name of Jesus. And here I am, Jesus telling me that. And I'm thinking, you mean that's all I would have had to do is deal with it? So, and he'd say, Tom, it's not, it's not you. It's, it was my name that had the power. Yeah, look, look, you're here. You would have had a much better year, but you're here. You got here anyway. Maybe you got here a little faster because of that. You know, but I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear Jesus say that. And then I'll say, well, back in 2013, I had an illness like that. Was that an attack? No, no, that was just, you walked in a room of 50 people that had the flu. You know, that was stupid, Tom. <laughs> that was not an attack. But in 2018, that one was. So you could have dealt with it. Yeah, I was waiting for you to deal with it. But you didn't. Okay, God, doctors, anoint, Deal with the possibility of what it could be from, okay? Don't yell and scream. Don't make a big deal about it. Don't spend an hour on it. The name of Jesus doesn't need all that fanfare. It, the power's in the name of Jesus. Satan, I don't know if you're causing us, but I know this. If you're causing us, apart from God's express will, I know that he's given me the authority to use the name of Jesus against all the power of the enemy. And so if you're causing us, apart from God's express will, I command you to take this off of me now in Jesus' name. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you. Boy, we thank you for the power there is in Jesus' name. It's just amazing when, when we picture Jesus hanging on that cross, and I've said this before. In, Col in Colossians, it says that everything in the universe is held together by you. Molecules, atoms are held together by you. Without your limits on, those, on matter, everything would fly apart. And so as you hung on that cross, you were holding the molecules of those spikes together. At the very moment, you're on that cross. That's, that's the control you have over everything. That's the power that there is in the name of Jesus. Father, we are in awe of that power. None of us have an inkling as to how powerful your name really is. But I pray, Lord, you'd help us to take more seriously what you've said about that name and the right that you've given us to use that name and the power there is in the word of God as it relates to anointing with oil, that we would take your word seriously, know that you meant everything that you wrote and that when we obey your word, when we trust in your word, we are honoring you. So Lord, make us men and women of the Bible. Make us men and women of the word. Make us men and women that look to you, Jesus, to be to have the answer for every situation in life that we encounter, health being one of them. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And we ask this in Christ's name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Go in God's peace. If you want to stay for prayer, uh, get the women back in that corner and the men up here in this uh, corner up here. God bless you all.